Thank you for joining the Blue Door Expo 2020 and our cybersecurity session um, called Cybersecurity Protecting at What Cost, where we'll be discussing understanding how to develop a people centric security organization to cater for the challenges that we see today and in the future. So, just to reiterate, the session name is Cybersecurity Protecting at What Cost. And as we all know, we're, we are living now in a world of, of disparate systems high connectivity between users, uh, remote working such as the, the COVID and, and uh, has brought into uh, our normal ways of working these days. So today in the panel, we're going to be looking at the key aspects of, of insights, designing and developing a, an approach to cybersecurity that keeps really the people at its centre. So my name is Jim Everett. I'm part of the digital team here at O2. Uh, where we look at security challenges, connectivity and infrastructure, and I'll be facilitating today's session. As I've been here for nearly 10 years now at O2, um, we've seen an awful lot of changes during that time, from physical hardware to virtualization into public clouds, from legacy data networks to software-defined networks and infrastructure, and of course in security, where unfortunately we see ever-evolving threats to our businesses and organizations across a whole wide range of attack services. As you know, we all used to sit in offices, but with COVID, remote working on the rise, data sitting in disparate infrastructures, how do we best protect the business, end users, citizens, and really safeguard that? And, and to me, this session is going to be really interesting to, I guess, garner the views across public sector um, and also trying to understand the right way of achieving the balance between end users doing their job in an easier way, maintaining that culture where security is there to enable rather than hinder and as we all know it takes years to establish a brand and a good business but potentially a few minutes of a cyber incident to ruin it so today we have a diverse panel with us including the national police chiefs council and how they're looking at cyber crime we have a venture capital organization where we see the future including investments market trends and, and their views one of our key enterprise partners um, samsung and of course not least the view of telephonica's open innovation hub partnership called wira and really why I connect Telefonica and technology, technological disruptors around the world. And where we see huge amounts of relevant innovation solving a lot of today's and tomorrow's security challenges. So let's start off with a quick introduction um, and also thanks to the panel members for their time invested and insights. So first of all, we have Phil Donnelly, uh, Detective Chief Inspector for the National Police Chief Council. Uh, secondly, we have Nick Dawson, and, and Nick is the global head of Samsung Business to Business Solution Sales. We also have Marcel van der Heiden, who's a partner in a VC firm called Speed Invest. And we also have our own Patricia Nickel, who heads up our venture development and partnerships within, within Wira. So, again, thank you for joining. Um, much appreciate your time. So, for those listening um, to this session, you'll also be able to find... Um, that you can ask questions in the chat um, chat box. So if you have any further questions, please do answer. We'll respond those throughout the, selection, throughout the session and they'll obviously be provided to you later on uh, where we can explore those in a bit more depth with, for you. So first of, first of all, um, I think I'll start with um, Patricia here. So a good warm-up question to the panel. Um, what do you see as the biggest issue faced by organizations when it comes to cybersecurity today? 
Hi, Jim. Thanks for having me on the panel. Um, just to start with, I think you actually mentioned the answer to that in your introduction. I think in 2020, we've had a big shift toward, towards remote work, and I think this also poses its own risks. A lot of hackers now are targeting tools that are used for remote work, and they're also using this urgency that is created with COVID-themed phishing emails. So I think that's definitely very complex phishing email have been a cybersecurity threat throughout 2020. Excellent. That's certainly something we see from our, our vendor ecosystem as well. So uh, absolutely. What about yourself, uh, Phil, from a, um, from a cybercrime perspective? I, I, I suppose that the, the biggest issue, I suppose, is education and that human element for us. Uh, you know, you can build the biggest and most secure network in the world, but we still have to be able to interact with it. Mm. And then, you know, and we, we become the, uh, I suppose, the, the weak link. You look at social engineering, phishing, uh, you know, those types of attacks. It's really easy to fall from them. You know, they, 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 you know the, the, the way that the, the criminals are utilizing social engineering and, and the, that, that human element of attack is getting more and more sophisticated, as well as the technical side getting more and more sophisticated. You know, I've seen phishing emails and stuff that looks so like the real thing that, that you know, you, you wonder how you wouldn't click on that as a link. But then it's building that, that, that culture in your organization of, uh, you know, so you, you can, you can uh, you know, get the cyber security awareness out there so people understand that, you know, if they click on it or they click on a link, that they, they're, they're, they're able to report it. There's not a blame culture in an organization. And it's building that, that, that cyber security message from the ground up doesn't matter who you are in an organization, you've, 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 you're involved in cybersecurity, you're involved in security, and you, and you need to be understanding where you fit into the chain and, and passing that information along if it happens. No, I totally agree with you. And, and incidentally, we, uh, we actually run a phishing simulation awareness um, attack on, on our, one of our internal business units. And, it's, um, and this is for educated professionals. And you're absolutely right, there was still a, a fairly good percentage of those that clicked on the links. Of course, it was a fake phishing because it was part and parcel of simulation awareness, but certainly getting that information across to uh, our end users about how easy it is, especially when they're working from home, the distractions from home potentially may make them to become, you know, clicking on links without potentially thinking, if that makes sense, Phil. So um, certainly agree with that particular sentiment. What, do you, what are you seeing, um, uh, I guess, from within Samsung uh, and that question to you Nick um, well I think I mean just to build on what you were just saying Jim and Phil as well uh, and, and again Patricia too we've got so many people now working outside of the bounds of the office and outside of the bounds of IT control it's something that we're used to in the mobile space be it at O2 be it at Samsung um, whatever we've been dealing this with uh, with this type of situation for you know over 15 almost 20 years now but we've got more people than ever before accessing more critical systems than ever before. And they're not always aware of the dangers that they themselves pose. Uh, most people don't act out of malicious intent, internal employees, but they make mistakes. Or the infrastructure that's in place by the organization isn't sufficient for their needs. And so they work outside the bounds of that and they expose themselves to risk. I think that right now is the biggest risk to business today. Yeah, it's, it's, it's that balance, isn't it, between security and that, that end user experience, really? Yeah. Um, so, Marcel, what are you seeing uh, within your environment? Yeah, I guess, uh, Jim, what we're focusing on is trying to take the humans out of the loop um, when it comes to securing themselves. Uh, so helping them, uh, you know, authenticate themselves to systems in a more, uh, in, with a better user experience and a more secure experience as well. Um, and on the other side, things like helping IT professionals deal with the large volumes of security alerts and giving them means to correlate those and, and rather look at a stream of information, you know, give them a narrative around how their organization is being attacked. Um, so those are things we look at quite a bit moving forward. You know, we do look at uh, threats, for, uh, for example, that maybe aren't very prevalent today, but could become important moving forward. And so we look at things like uh, post-quantum security, as well as um, you know how do we how do we detect and combat deepfakes, and, and also like how do we protect the AI systems that companies are rolling out themselves? How do we make sure they they are not being attacked? So those are a couple of things we look at. So we've had an example there of, of, of how we're operating day to day 
get that balance right between enabling that end user, enabling um, our customers to be able to securely work and collaborate with ourselves, but again, making sure we're aligned to those security and, and security operating models. But not only that, we're now looking at you know these different platforms that are bringing into play today, such as AI, and how we can protect not only our users' enterprises, but potentially preventing things in the future that may be out there um, some of the things we don't know about, such as some of the cyber threats that are out there. So, no, uh, that's that's my summary um, for for that for that particular question. It seems to me that balance is the uh, is the right phrase here. So, mm-hmm. I guess in the, the 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 next phase, I mean, we look at cybersecurity being, you know, we've talked about end users, so the ecosystem of end user device, the the network it traverses, whether that be Wi-Fi public internet or even if you're on, on, on the private network, the systems being accessed, the proliferation of cloud, the different repositories of data and storing data. How, how I see there's lots of different steps there and lots of different layers, um, and we're away now from the traditional boundaries that we that we reference. What do you think is the best approach to look at this holistically and knit all those together to give us that full integrated view um, but whilst also making sure that the end users can can act in an, in an agile way. So, um, Patricia, what do you think is the, uh, the best way of managing those those disparate systems to make sure it's fully integrated? Of course. So I think when it comes to cybersecurity threats, it's like bullet wounds. There's a way in, there's something that happens in the middle, and there's always an exit wound as well. So I think it's just about organization and companies working with their vendors and making sure that they're fully protra- protected. So there's protection, making sure that nothing goes in. There's protection with um, remediation at the end and also make sure that everyone understands what's happening uh, with the cyber threat and which parts have been exposed as well. So, so detecting, responding and, and mitigation of that particular incident from happening again in the future. Um, exactly. Yeah, certainly seeing a lot more of those types of services going out into to the marketplace. Um, Nick, any, any views from your good self? Um, yeah, I do. And I think, again, I think it sort of builds a little bit on what Patricia was saying. Um, one of the things that I sort of try to impress upon customers on a regular basis is that we're all partners out there in the world. Um, no, no, no company, large or small, just deals with one vendor. Uh, you yeah. know, they have, a, they have a mishmash of technologies from a variety of different places. Um, and they tend to have, customers tend to have conversations with, you know, one vendor and then the next one, the next one. The reality is we're all partners behind the scenes. We all work very closely together. Samsung and O2, for example, work very, very closely together on a daily basis. And we have the ability to come in and speak with customers uh, at a holistic level about, you know, if I'm responsible at my end for the hardware and securing the endpoint and proving that, and then having the platform level technology that is integrated into the hardware, but then runs on your network and then goes beyond that and then ties into your UEM infrastructure, whatever that might be. We all work together. And I would encourage customers to avail themselves of a larger conversation with with their entire technology ecosystem. If they ask, they'll find out that we're all willing to sit at the table as one. Um, And that addresses the holistic view, I think, that Patricia was referring to. I, I, I couldn't agree with you more, actually. It's about, there's a lot of overlapping technologies within security and it's about again, harnessing the best of the approaches from all those different vendors. And we are seeing a not necessarily a massive expanse of different vendors, but a consolidation of, of a, a number of strategic vendors that they work with to make sure those overlaps are minimized, to make sure the integration path from a security operated model is, is, is simplified. Mm-hmm. As we all know, there's a, the needle in the hay that you get so many incidents and so many logs from, from so many different platforms and systems. It's really how do you minimize that from an operational burden perspective as well so so phil obviously this is really really important part of policing in terms of that that whole ecosystem in terms of data it's incredibly sensitive for your organization any advice you could provide here i suppose from from, from my point of view it's it's, it's considering cyber security from 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 the ground up from the initial conception of an idea or a program or we're going to buy a new piece of kit thinking about right how is this going to integrate with the systems that we've got and has the company i'm buying it from or the the service i'm i'm i'm, I'm procuring have they considered cyber security or is it an add-on is it something they've been they've been thinking about from from the word go or is it something that they've developed this amazing system and then somebody down the line's gone 
have you ever thought about GDPR or data protection? And they've gone, oh, and it's been bolted on. You know, you want people thinking about it right to the word go. The, you know, whether it be internet of thing devices, you know, uh, cloud services, you know, servers that you're buying yourself or, or software that you're, you know, you're procuring, you need to be thinking, is, is security embedded in this system? And can I integrate that security in with my, with, with my current infrastructure? So it's bringing the security operation model right to the beginning of any process when you're looking at new implementations of services or, or, or cloud-based platforms. Yes, 100%. Excellent. And, and, and Marcel, what about you, your good self in terms of, of, of bringing that through? Yeah, I think um, I think if, I mean, totally agree that this this you know combinatorial explosion of complexity of you know devices, but also the IT infrastructure itself and how that technology stack is getting more and more granular, microservices, and you know, all the way through the data center to the edge data center. I mean, that's that becomes uh, an environment that's really hard to manage, especially from a security perspective, of course. The way we look at it in terms of you know creating a holistic approach to this is through data. All these systems uh, generate and can share a lot of data that is relevant uh, from a security point of view. And so, if you think about how do we, you know, how do you holistically look at an environment like that? For us, it's through data, and it's through the ability, you know, creating a data overlay to understand what are the threats, to understand what are the mitigations, but also to orchestrate responses uh, to yep. create workflows and collaboration so that's uh, that's kind of the way we look at it yeah again the, the proliferation of security orchestration automation and, and response mm -hmm. um, excuse me, the acronym of, of SOAR but we see it an awful lot mm -hmm. now with um, improving the operations center within uh, within SOC environments for large customers um, and, and really making that as operationally as efficient as possible so for, for me uh, looking at this holistically it is about understanding the culture it is understanding about the data mm. the current security investments making sure that you get return on investment on return of, of investment on those um, futures as well and making sure that security is at the embryonic stage of any of those of those investments I do recall going back to um, a, a CISO from a large legal organization organization where they actually referenced as part of any procurement activity, right from the from the day day dot, it's really about engaging with the the, the CISO and the security organisation to make sure again they double check everything to make sure it does fit the security operating models and and really supporting the security strategy. So to make sure again holistically that that is that is covered on uh, covered covered accurately. So that leads me nicely onto I guess my my next question and. Um, you know, we've touched upon it briefly around the human element um, and potentially being the human being the, um, what's the best phrase, but the weakest link in the cyber cyber chain. And the very nature of people is probably one of the biggest security holes in, in any organization. You could put layers upon layers of security, but actually humans are there with their devices, with their PCs, with their laptops. How do we make sure we put in the right security policies and systems but actually not hinder that individual to do their job whether they're a police officer whether they are a call center operative or field service what's what's what do we do to make them uh, i guess not actually stop them from doing their job role but actually make it easier for them and i, I think I'll, I'll ask that one of nick first because obviously you do a lot of work with end users with with samsung devices um so mm -hmm. over to you nick um, yeah, thanks, Jim. And uh, no, I think this is a fascinating question. I'm sure there's going to be some great answers to it. From my perspective, I actually think that we, as an industry as a whole, um, have actually done a fairly good job over the past decade or more of abstracting a lot of complexity away from the end user. There was a time I remember, and I'm sure some of you remember it too, when you know, you'd give somebody a mobile device and you go to this link and download a thing and change that and do the other thing and then install something else and it was all left up to them. All of that complexity's moved away now. We've shifted it over to the IT department. But I think to, uh, to sort of build up again uh, upon something that Marcel was just saying a few moments ago, we have this proliferation now of new devices, which is only going to accelerate. 5G is going to beget 
finally uh, enterprise IoT at scale with um, you know all sorts of different types of devices fulfilling different functions, too much data for us to, as humans to handle, AI systems come into play as decision support tools, and really what we're now working on is abstracting a lot of the complexity away, we did it for the end user, but now abstracting it away from the IT department as well so that we can free up those human resources to do more value add things. Um, that's sort of what we're working on. In today, the simple answer is, in today's world, there is absolutely no reason for the user experience to be impacted in the name of security. There is a way of doing it. And if you're putting up barriers and blockades to people in the name of security, they are, and I said this earlier, simply going to find a way to work around it somehow. And you're doing yourself a disservice. There is no need to. The systems and tools exist from all sorts of different organizations. We happen to be one with O2 as a partner, and there's no need to block yourself. I uh, to totally agree. And what about yourself, Patricia? Any thoughts around this this human factor and what we're seeing within uh, within Wira? Of course, and a couple of, of things, and I have to agree with um, Nick when he said about workarounds. If you can't do something with your with your normal processes, you will find a workaround. And shadow IT can be a big problem for cybersecurity attacks, and the one that we've seen as well. Uh, I think on my side. I don't necessarily agree that cybersecurity has to be invisible. I think actually the organizations have to create a culture of cyber interest and cyber awareness and empower mm. the end user and employees with information. So for example, in our portfolio, we have a company that has developed a product which displays traffic light system warning signal on emails rather than blocking them or letting them through. This actually empowers them with information and it enforces good habits and cybersecurity training notions. So making sure that all of the employees have cybersecurity interest when, when they do certain activities in the companies. I, I would agree that the, the information security process and the ways of working needs to be impressed, um, not stealthily, but um, overtly, so people are aware of it, but it needs to be done at the right um, level from 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 sea level down, and making sure that the right culture is in place to make sure that it, we need to be aware. Um, information security and governance is, is there for a for a reason, right? Um, to protect our businesses and and data is the the new innovation. So, for me, certainly culture is a is a huge part of this and being able to be pushed down. But it's it's the old scenario of using the stick and the carrot to protect those for the end user's perspective. Do you want to beat them with a stick or do you want to give them a carrot to effectively motivate and incentivize them to be vigilant, be aware of what's going on to make sure that, again, they're protecting the business, protecting the brand, but more importantly, protecting that the data um, that, that lies between that. Because, as you know, uh, d data is now proliferated across the entire infrastructure into all these different locations. So, again, that traffic light and making it simple to, to see is, is vital. Um, Marcel, what are you seeing um, around this area with, within your marketplace? Mm. Yeah, so I mean, first of all, I agree with, uh, you know, with both comments before. Um, I think it's important to create a security culture. I think it's difficult as well, and it's a lengthy process. And it's an ongoing process. Um, I'm not a big believer, per se, in changing people's behavior. I think that's very difficult. Um, mm. And I definitely believe, uh, you know, agree with Nick. I think there's a lot of technology out there to automate uh, and to help users in a very, uh, you know, while keeping a good user experience. And uh, password managers is maybe one example. Uh, Multi-factor mm -hmm. authentication you in using biometrics you know, are really great user experience experiences to log on to systems and authenticate yourselves into networks and so forth that provide even a better user experience than typing in a password. So I really believe that technology can kind of take away a lot of that, um, that, that risk, uh, you know, even, even down to developers writing code and having machines review code and take out, mm -hmm. you know, a certain level of box in that code. So I'm a, I'm a big fan uh, of kind of automating away a lot of the, a lot of the complexity for users, whether it's an end user or an IT operations person. Yeah, or, or a machine. We've seen the rise of machines now and how they operate and the process that they run in the back end, right? So how do we understand what's going on there? Yep. Um, a lot of these things are, are changing. Uh, Phil, um, from from your perspective, obviously you're, you're, you're responsible for a highly critical part of our society. 
how how do you make sure that I guess your internal customers are, are doing their job to the to the maximum of their ability? I'm I'm not sure what you mean by an internal customer. <laughs> oh, I meant your. Okay, so let me rephrase it. So, how are you ensuring that the police are being as secure and effective in their in their role from a security perspective? Because they're obviously handling a lot of of of, of really sensitive data and sensitive information. So yeah, uh, well, I mean, we we. we it's, it's making sure that everything we do adheres to all the security standards and is, is as secure as, as possible. And a lot of it is we, we're following the guidance that we put out. So, you know, if you, there's a, there's a lot of guidance around cyber security on the NCFC website uh, for, for individuals and, and there's a load of stuff in, for, for business from small to medium sized enterprise, you know, all the way up to, to big multinational companies. Uh, but a lot of times for myself, it's, 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 it's just getting the basics right understanding and your staff understanding what is a strong password for years we've made passwords really really difficult to remember so you know it's uppercase lowercase letters special characters and, and all sorts of things that make it really really hard for a human to remember really really easy for a computer to to, to brute force uh, you know actually the guidance now is three random words you know pick three mm -hmm. random words have different passwords for different for different systems you know, and, and, you know, simple advice like that, that people can understand, well, okay, I can pick three random words and understand how that makes something secure, because the longer a password is, the harder it is to brute force, uh, and then utilising multi-factor authentication and other, other systems on top of, you know, password and just becoming one of those will make that, that, that secure system. And, you know, we're pushing that out and that message out to our to you know, in between in between forces and and in between organisations and our, our internal selves, so that you know we don't fall foul of something that we're we're telling people that they should be doing. I really really like the uh, the three word password um, analogy. Yeah, something I I will take away, and because obviously we have to access to various different systems, and as you say, that complexity of of, of passwords and storing those passwords. But actually, if it's three easy words that you remember. Um, quite right. It's 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 more secure, um, but it's also easier for that for that end, end user to remember as well. So I think that's a great example. Um, that leads me on to so so inevitably we've talked about humans being the I guess that weakest link within that cyber chain. So there is an inevitability, rightly or wrongly, that mistakes will happen, um, and obviously we don't want to be have that that kind of blame game because we're about creating that that right culture. But what happens in, I guess, in the police services when, when mistakes do happen, or if they do happen, of course, um, what, what is the best advice there that you could uh, offer in terms of creating that culture of accepting the human trait of, of um, because as you know, cybercrime are, are really targeting the psychological flaws of, of human beings. Yeah, is that aimed at me? Yes, yes, Phil, yeah. So. Uh, yeah, uh, it's it's you know it's not about those care tactics. It's not about you know oh if I if I report this, am I going to get in trouble? Uh, it's it's building that culture of of learning and you know mistakes happen. We're human, you know we're going to make mistakes. You're going to you know you, you want to build everything in and and there's a big difference between somebody making a mistake and somebody doing something malicious. If it's a mistake and it's a genuine mistake, then it's making sure that support network's there and that there's an education come out of it. Not for the per not just the person that's made that mistake. But the whole organisation, and hopefully why they can learn from that mistake, uh, and whether that be a configuration issue or, or somebody clicking on the link, the more people know about that is is really important. But also, what's important is is people understanding how they report and the importance of reporting quickly. Yeah. I've dealt with, with a number of incidents uh, where if it had been reported, you know, if you take something like a ransomware, you know, the sooner that's reported and people can start shutting the systems down, you know, if somebody's laptops been locked and they sit there and go oh what do I do or you know a, a, a 10 minute scratch in the head and then report it within them 10 minutes you know it could have spread throughout the whole organization was that they make them calls quick enough it might not stop it spreading one you know completely but it will hopefully have some impact so it's just mm. informing people that they are they're part they they're, they're part of the solution you know they're, they're that human firewall they're, they're mm. there to help and, and to and, and how they report rather than sat there going I've got no idea who I ring. What do I do now that something's gone wrong? I uh, to totally agree. And having systems in place where it's easy to talk to your 
um, internal security and fraud division, making that conversation as easy as possible and accessing that. And as you say, reporting as soon as possible, you can then determine where potentially that's propagated to internally by having the right systems. So you can effectively quarantine, quarantine those devices to make sure that risk is mitigated internally. So totally agree with the reporting as, as soon as possible. Um, I, I, I guess in large organizations like, like yourself, Nick, is there a process that you guys um, work to within, within Samsung? Um, well, I feel I should take a contrarian view and advocate for a public flogging when there's a breach in security or something, but no, clearly that's not the way to go. Uh, you want to encourage people, you want them to feel safe to come forward and, uh, and be able to be honest about it and then work through it. I think the only thing I might add to what Phil said, though, is, um, and this used to be something that was really only available to large organizations, government organizations in the past, but um, there's an awful lot of analytics data that can be used. We have algorithms, you can call it AI, you can call it an algorithm, whatever you want. Uh, a lot of this ex exists at the platform level within computing devices today on the networks that can be used to understand better where something went wrong, where data went, if there has been a data breach, uh, where might it have gone, what other systems might it have touched, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, sort of some of the downstream effects. So I encourage people to take advantage of those to understand what's, what's possible, what's, what's available to them. But not just large organizations. Increasingly today, we can do this for small, medium business too, as a managed service. Um, you know, as an industry, I'm not saying me personally, but as an industry. Indeed, no. Thank, thank you for that. And Patricia, obviously, you're at the forefront here with solving a lot of security challenges. And uh, what's your advice here? No, of course. Um, I think first of all, I just want to say, employees are not cybersecurity experts, nor they should be, and they shouldn't be blamed. Just to echo what Marcel was saying, that people don't really change their behaviors and that we should use other ways of, of providing cybersecurity uh, support. We also work, for example, for, with a lot of startups in training in cybersecurity. How do we make training more engaging? How do we make sure people actually want to be compliant with some of the policies and cybersecurity policies we have in the company? Uh, but just to give another example, for example, a system should not fall apart if one element fails, if an employee fails. And we should actually look at the system diagram and understand what happened there. Just to give an example of that and really cybersecurity essentials, about 85% of, of FTSE 100 companies don't have DMARC in protection mode. And that's actually one of the only ways you can uh, prevent spoofing your own domain. And having that set in protection mode actually keeps everyone safer and makes sure that employees don't do a lot of mistakes or, or don't have problems with, with spoofing. So I think one of the ways in which companies can make sure that mistakes are reduced is also having all of these essential cybersecurity processes in place. Yeah, D DMARC is, especially with today with, with COVID and effectively making sure you have that end-to-end -end security to authentic authenticate the domain where the email is being sent to, really, really important from a supplier and distribution networks, all the companies and organizations you work with, really providing that, I guess, level of assurance that the spoofing will be coming from, from that organization. And you create that authentication and trust layer when you are communicating with customers, suppliers, and, and your logistics organization. So totally agree with that. And, and Marcel, um, over to you. I mean, what, what is your advice here when you're talking to a lot of your seed organizations? Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm a, if I'm a great expert here. I mean, <laughs> in, intuitively, I would say scare tactics don't work. You know, I, mm. I can see you want people to report, you know, issues or concerns, you know, as, as soon as possible. I definitely agree if you can use data to really get to the root cause and understand, you know, really what happened. I think that's very helpful. You know, use it as a learning experience as an organization. I think what uh, what I find interesting is how can we use these learnings also across organizations and so not just in our own large or small organizations, but uh, how can we use this across organizations and as a, a community, if you want, like, like you know, somebody said at the beginning, we're all partners in this. Uh, how can we share information to prevent issues, um, you know, amongst our partners? No, to again, totally agree. And, you know, you look at the technology that can be potentially used here. We've talked about, uh, as Patricia mentioned, you know, making sure we have understanding of what's going on with the systems and all the data and information that flows in and out of that and making sure that, again, we understand where things may have happened, where things may have propagated to, and obviously to, to mitigate things like GDPR or data loss or, or, or breaches. Mm -hmm. 
is there any other technology here that you can foresee that will, I guess, help with 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 that particular uh, problem? If that's a question for me, then um, yeah, I, I would think AI or machine learning, whatever you want to call it. I mean, for me, that's such a uh, foundational piece of technology that's you know pretty mature by now uh, you know combine that with all these systems out there security systems that throw off a lot of data uh, have a lot of information available I think there's probably a lot that can be done in terms of you know using data to do good uh, to really understand in real time what your security posture is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I agree any any I guess comments from the uh from the panel, Patricia, um, anything from yourself here? I think like myself, there's a lot of interesting new technology that makes sure that um, the vulnerabilities are discovered very quickly. So for example, we have a startup that has create, created a deception platform that actually baits mm -hmm. hackers mm -hmm. and, and wants to see where they are attacking the corporation and if they are attacking certain companies. I think that's an interesting reversal of roles. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing a lot of interesting technology in that space. I would, um, so, sorry Jim, I was just going to jump in, it's Nick here. The, um, the, one of the uh, emerging areas over the past several years is in uh, mobile threat defense, which is by definition, it's AI, it's algorithms. And what it is, is I, uh, for most of my career in mobility, which has spanned more than 15 years now, spent a long time thinking about protecting the end point, be it a smartphone, a tablet, a Chromebook, whatever it may be. But if we can extend the threat protection out, uh, threat protection envelope out beyond that end point, and that's really what mobile threat defense tools do, and what they're doing is they're measuring provenance of data packets, where they're coming from, how they're structured, all sorts of different things, and detecting whether they think something's a threat. Increasingly, what we're doing, for example, at Samsung, we do it with our Knox platform on our devices. We feed data from the device, not, not personal data, just uh, abstract things like how it's being used, where it is, what network it's on, stuff like that, back up into these algorithms to, better, to do better threat detection. This is along the same lines. Also, Patricia earlier uh, mentioned um, one of the companies in her portfolio that is doing something, it seems so simple, um, but giving you sort of the, the traffic light approach to an email, are you, or any message, presumably, you know, is there potentially something sensitive here? The key point, to go back to what Marcel was saying, is um, AI, I mean, you know, it's not killer robots with angry eyes coming to kill us all. It's about, <laughs> it's, you know, these are very useful tools. There's so much data out there that we can't make sense of it all in, uh, fast enough. And these are our, AI is our friend. Uh, analytics are a friend to be able to be used as decision support tools or automated decision tools in certain cases. Mm. Yeah, we see that a lot within the SOC environment as well, right, where you get all the logs coming in. Abnormal uh, behavioral type techniques now using AI rather than uh, looking through the, you know, significant millions of logs that will come through that. So how do you understand and prioritize which are the ones that are causing the biggest amount of danger so that you can remediate and mitigate that so certainly seen uh, a lot more around that whole AI machine learning to really augment the security operations uh, function um, so quick question for me there's there's an awful lot of technology out there awful lot of vendors you know large organizations have got a potentially larger resources and you know cybersecurity isn't a cheap area and potentially a lot of a lot of cost involved um, what can so the the mid small organisations where you may have and even larger ones where you know resources potentially limited, how can they best go about the approach to ensure that they have the right security in 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 place to uh, to make sure that they're protected to the to the best of their that their budget allows. So I guess that one's for for yourself, Phil, to start off with. How how do, you've obviously got a lot of a lot of police forces up and down the country. Some could be small, some could be large. How, how do you go about ensuring that protection? So, I mean, we've, we've, the, the, the MPC cybercrime program and policing as a whole has, has, has gone through a massive change in the past few years around how we deal with cybercrime. Uh, we've gone from, say, three, four years back uh, with only a number of forces having a dedicated cybercrime team to every single force in the country now has dedicated officers uh, dealing with cybercrime, and that's across, you know, the investigative side, the protect side. So, so looking at protecting businesses and into uh, working with young people to, to, to draw them away from cybercrime into cybersecurity, into 
into other areas. So it's it, it has been a massive investment in, in cyber, uh, cyber crime and, and, and within the cyber crime program. And on the back of that, we've, we've come up with a number of, of, of initiative ideas. Like I say, we work really closely with the NCSC and the guidance that they put out and our protect teams are out day in, day out, you know, giving that guidance out to businesses and, and, and focusing in on small to medium sized enterprises. Uh, we've also, we're just starting up in, a, in a, most of the regions and most of the country, we're setting up cyber resilience centres. So the, these are, are partnerships with industry and partnerships with business, uh, looking at how we can secure business better uh, and focusing really on that, at that SME type market. Uh, and then one of the projects that I'm directly involved in is called the Police Cyber Alarm. Again, this is still in pilot phase, but this is looking at, uh, it's, there's sort of like two parts to it. The first part is looking at firewall data and, and denied firewall logs and suspicious activities hitting the external networks of, of business networks. And the police uh, be, uh, taking that data and then looking at it to be able to track and, and identify attack trends and attacks that are occurring against an individual business, but also looking that across multiple businesses and multiple areas to see what attacks are going on. Are they localised? Are they national? You know, is it a national attack? Is it a new form of attack? And then alongside that, we're able to vulnerability scan the external networks of, uh, you know, the external IP addresses and, and the websites of organisations to tell them about known vulnerabilities. So, you know, this is aimed at, like I say, the small to medium sized enterprises to sort of like say that, that, that may not be able to afford or may not have looked at it before and we'll give them the, you know, a, a, a basic vulnerability scan and we're able to tell them about what attacks are happening on their network and then we're using that data to, uh, to, 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 to look at the bigger picture. We're not taking content, we're, we're, we're not taking, we're not packet uh, capturing, we're not packet sniffing, we're looking at the logs that are coming out of the firewall uh, and from there we're able to take the information that we need. So that, that's something that we've been working on and, and we're just rolling out in a number of pilot regions. Uh, if I can do a little plug, uh, the, the <laughs> website to go to is, <laughs> is, is cyberalarm.police.uk. There's loads of information on there around what the, what the system actually does, what areas we're, we're, on, we're working in at this moment in time and, and the regions that we're working with. Uh, and also the, there's a lot of information on there around making sure that it's secure and what we're doing is ethical. This isn't Big Brother. This is, this is looking at the firewall logs and this is looking at the, the log data to see what attacks are occurring so that we can better protect individual organisations but also better understand exactly what's going on within cybercrime in the UK. Yeah, perhaps a, a plug is always good, Phil. Plug is always good. Um, <laughs> and, and, and just to follow on from that, Telefonica or O2 have got our own vulnerability assessment platform as well. Uh, which we call VAMS, which does exactly that from a vulnerability scanning point of view. It's a continual checking of uh, the external threats that they're facing. So perhaps it's a conversation we should pick up at, at some point. Um, Patricia, uh, any recommendations around how you uh, ensure protection at a where you have a, a resource-limited organisation? Of course, for me, it's going to be software, software, software. <laughs> <laughs> We're seeing more and more vendors that have products that are affordable to SMEs. And I think a lot of the startups that we work with, and, and by the way, Myra does have an accelerator in partnership with NCSE, so we do work together on cybersecurity startups. We've seen a lot of startups that have out-of-the-box solutions just ready to be plugged in by companies. One of the companies, for example, make sure that that SMEs achieve govern government standard cybersecurity protection in 24 hours. So there's a lot of solutions out there making sure that even smaller companies can be protected. No, I agree for those, those points as well. And Marcel, from, from your perspective, um, what advice would you give uh, those, those resource limited organizations? Yeah, I think, uh, first of all, I think it's actually a really important problem. I mean, we think about security a lot, uh, or, or people talk about security a lot, maybe on a nation state and large companies, you know, we see all the large bridges. But the reality is a lot of, I think the numbers came out uh, recently that I saw like 75% uh, of SMBs will uh, had a tech in, an attack in the last year. I mean, that's a huge number. And a good number of those go out of business simply because of that. And so I think it's really important. Um, we, um, you know, if you allow me the, the shameless plug as well, uh, we just <laughs> invested in a, in a company, a UK company actually, spin out of BAE called SOCOS, uh, SOC.OS, 
and they've built uh, a, a seam saw of sorts uh, for the for the mid market basically, and it does exactly uh, what what somebody mentioned before. It collects information out of the network and the point security solutions that you know companies have, and which is a pretty mature market. And it you know collects them, correlates them, triages them, and it gives you know people a single pane of glass to look at. So, you know, I think it's it's up to companies, vendors, um, be it established vendors or new vendors, to come up with economical, easy to use solutions that you know have some you know use software to uh, to to help small and medium businesses. Yeah, I think you you're, you're spot on <clears throat> with with that particular one to be economic and viable for, for these small organizations to, to mm. really embrace that type of capability. I mean, we offer something very, very similar um, here at O2 where we work with customers in terms of cyber assessment, uh, where we have a look, um, s- a small few hours where we really review their security posture, current investments, uh, and really provide them with a traffic light approach as to uh, green, red, amber, as I'm sure you can yeah. imagine what, what they what they mean. And the three key words that we use are, let's assess what you've got, let's optimize what you've got with your existing investments, and then potentially transform. So for me, it's that approach where you are driving that value for money based on the investment and really trying to prioritize that um, quick, not necessarily quick fix, but the fix and improvement to that security posture. Um, mm-hmm. So that's the way that we typically approach, approach this as well. Yeah. Nick, from, from, oh, sorry, I'll start after you. Yeah, no, maybe one comment. I think it, so. I think it's less. Of, I mean, I agree with Nicola. This has to be a software solution. I think it's less about technology. I think it's really about uh, user experience and really driving the the you know the cost points down, driving the price points down, and making sure it's easy to buy, easy to deploy, uh, and you don't need you know cutting edge technology to do that. Agreed. It needs to be a, what I would term a Ron seal. It does exactly what it says in the tin to to solve the problem as easy as possible uh, without incorporating additional complexity. Totally agree. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and, and Nick, what about yourself from Samsung's point of view? Um, well, while you were all talking, I was going to make a sign and hold it up with my, my corporate plug. But uh, no, <laughs> uh, the, uh, no I, I think either so I could repeat everything everybody's uh, already said in slightly different ways. But if I have a piece of advice, if I could maybe give, because we see this a lot. Listen, I've, I've dealt with the largest companies in the world, but we deal with small, medium business as well. Um, it can be overwhelming. And I have a message for people in industry and a message for, for, for customers. For customers, listen, this can seem overwhelming, very complicated. Uh, it's not your area of expertise. Um, you know, I'm not a specialist in what you do. You're not a specialist in what I do. The good news is that there are experts out there. And the reality is, as everybody else has said, this is the information and the systems are actually quite accessible to you. Um, primarily, probably through some of your major technology suppliers, which for a good number of you out there, presumably is going to be O2 and uh, the rest of the Telefonica family. Um, you know, uh, they can provide you managed services, they can turn this on. We work with uh, managed service providers around the world with our Knox platform. So our Knox platform is a security and management infrastructure that overlays and extends the capabilities in Android on Samsung devices and we work to uh, embed that into managed service offerings so that uh, our mutual customers can go out there and simply turn things on um, pay uh, you know a couple of pounds a month maybe for an extra little bit of something the point is this it need not be overwhelming and it need not be overly complex for you the customer there are people out here who will take care of it for you in a modular way. For people in industry, my only warning is, most of your customers don't understand what you're talking about. Um, This is very complicated (laughs) stuff, right? They don't understand. Don't try to dazzle them and overwhelm them. You're there to help them. That's what we try to do. I'm sitting there going, I'm nodding my head. So yes, complexity um, can be be seen as a horrible thing to to approach and embrace. But if you can do that in a simple manner, I certainly think that's it's the way the way forward. And I guess when you're looking at, I guess the way the businesses are operating now, we, we see more uh, more and more organisations having cloud first um, type approaches to to their business with the use of cloud services, um, moving away from their traditional infrastructure. Um, what do you believe that that uh, has an advantage or or a disadvantage from a security perspective? And you know. 
effectively you're moving your infrastructure out where those public cloud environments are responsible for the security around the infrastructure, but obviously data is still traversing in and out of those environments that you're responsible for. Do you, do you see that um, that has an impact in terms of how you're operating? Uh, and I guess I'll ask you, Sir Patricia, first, as um, you're seeing an awful lot of these organizations becoming more cloud and software based. Of course, um, I think in terms of cloud services, they can help companies a lot. Of course, and they, they reduce costs, but there's also a lot of security threats with them as well. We've seen some interesting startups in the cloud space, almost like cloud brokers, so making sure that one company doesn't just use one cloud service and they can switch between them if there's any issue. Uh, so that happens a lot, for example, in asset management where you're not allowed to use just one cloud cloud provider, you need to use several and then have them in place if in case something happens with one of them. Yeah, <clears throat> no, again, agree. We're seeing a lot of organizations, you know, with remote workers happening now is how do you secure that access um, to security policies through, through cloud enforcement, for example, whilst they're accessing either um, application within the public cloud or within their private cloud. And we've got a number of different um, services that can support that. But Phil, from your perspective, I'm not sure um, how much of these cloud services you guys are using, but um, do you think that's a good thing or, 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 or an advantage or a disadvantage from your point of view? It's a bit of both, really. It, you know, being able to, 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 to spin up uh, and, and throw a lot of computing power at particular problems is really, really useful. Uh, but then, like you say, there are, there, are, there are disadvantages around not controlling your own hardware, uh, especially with some of the data that we hold. Uh, but for me, the, the important thing for organisations is, is, as we've all, you know, working with any partner, is making sure you read the terms and conditions and you understand where your data is going to be and, and how the organisation is going to handle your data. Because at the end of the day, it's still your data. So, you know, you're still responsible for it. Uh, uh, so, you know, it's just a matter of reading those terms and conditions, making sure that you, you, you fully understand, you know, the, 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 where the data is going to be stored, how it's going to be stored what's happening to it at rest, what's happening to it at transit. So that although it's not within your, your, your four walls or your own infrastructure, you're fully confident that it's, it's being protected to the best that it can be. So it's a, a bit of a good thing and a bad thing. Good thing that um, you know, you're, you're, you're losing a little bit of control, but as long as you have the requisite security around that, and of course you read the terms and conditions, then it could potentially be a, a good thing as well. As long as you've got the right security processes in terms of that data, where it's held, and the flow in and out of those environments. So uh, what about yourself, Marcel? So the way I think about it, I think cloud infrastructures, cloud applications are probably a lot more secure than what, what companies can build themselves, uh, you know, in particular thinking about small and medium businesses. Um, I'm a big fan also from a security perspective in terms of you know, adopting cloud services uh, or using cloud cloud infrastructures. I think the, the complexity comes when you, you know, when you're combining different cloud services, uh, different data centers, your internal infrastructure, and then the cloud service that you use. So I think again, it's this level of the complexity of combining multiple systems, platforms, devices, that's where things get 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 complex, and and of course, of, you know, you need to read the terms and conditions, and you need to be able to answer all of those questions. But I, I I'm, I'm a big fan of cloud, uh, also from a security perspective. Yeah, I think it's getting that balance right between again taking that security, that infrastructure that cloud provide, but then not confusing or complicating that uh, overarching um, sprawl mm. of data and data repositories where it becomes a little bit too difficult to. Uh, to manage, so keeping it down to, uh, I guess, a, a manageable number of, of infrastructure locations um, is a wise thing to uh, to consider there. Yeah. Um, Nick, Samsung, um, mm -hmm. any thoughts around cloud? I know that you've obviously got um, a, a number of services around that too. We do, we do. Uh, I, I've been, um, you know, there's pro like everyone said, there's pros and cons to it. What I see from our customer base is uh, customers that are in highly sensitive and highly regulated industries still tend to um, over-index a little bit towards on-premise services, so non-cloud uh, infrastructure. And again, the, the pro there, the benefit is uh, they have a far greater control over the system itself and the data and the responsibility for it. The benefit of cloud is obvious uh, to me is it can be updated in real time. 
Um, the trick is you need to avail yourself of a cloud service from a reputable provider. Uh, you need to know who they are, uh, what they do, as Marcel said, read the terms and conditions, all of those things. You are ultimately responsible for the data. Um, you know, you can't abrogate your responsibility there. But uh, the, the advantage is someone is going to take care of an awful lot of the security, the updating, the patching, and things like that for you, especially if you're a small, medium business. So uh, there's, a, there's a definitely a huge benefit there um, in cloud. Uh, we at Samsung, just in case anyone's interested, we use a lot of cloud services for a lot of things that we do to run our business, but we do have an awful lot of systems. I work in one of the most secure R&D facilities in the world at Samsung headquarters here in Seoul, and um, there, we have a lot of systems that are offline that we won't connect to the internet um, just because, you know, in an overabundance of caution. Excellent. Now, uh, sovereignty and mm -hmm. where your data is located and, and and really it's still effectively owning that responsibility of the data um, is, is key there, whilst of course remembering to read the terms and the conditions. Yes. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to ask, um, next question really is, I'm going to ask Phil to, uh, to respond to this one. Uh, because as we all know, um, the reason why cybersecurity is really one of the most important and critical aspects is that criminals often make money from this and where there is money to be made criminals will flow and especially from a from a cyber perspective so what mindset do you think is needed by organizations um, to make sure that you're up to date and and you've got a dynamic response to try and mitigate that whole landscape of attacks out there uh, I suppose for me I mean I've been investigating cyber crime for seven years uh, you know and, and yes things have got more and more complex but we're still seeing organizations and, and, and individuals falling for the, 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 the basic scams. You know, we, we, you know, there are a lot more complex scams out there, but, but organizations still haven't got the basics right. And I suppose the, the most of the, you know, the best advice I can give uh, around, you know, cybersecurity is, is get the basics right first. You know, make sure that you've, you've got your, your password uh, protocols right. Uh, you know, th things like that. So you, you, you've, you've got your basics right, and then you can build on there to protect against the more, the more secure systems. And, and, and like, uh, you know, the guys have been saying around, you know, there's a lot of software out there now, there's a lot of systems out there that will do a lot of this for you. So invest in cybersecurity before you've been ransomware. It's no good sat there going, I wish I'd done this. <laughs> you know, we, we all, yeah. we, you know, we, we all insure our houses, we all have car insurance, we all have all of those things. But we don't always invest in cybersecurity and organizations don't always invest in cybersecurity as a as a priority you talk to you know when i was a protect officer you talk to to, to ceos and, and ma managers of small to medium sized enterprises and they they see it as a burden and rather than it being something that they need to do you know which you know a lot of companies that are ransomware never recover because of either the financial thing or they've, they've lost the data and, and the, the business goes under and that's a real shame you know when a lot of times it's to, when you actually look at the vector of the attack, it could have been quite simply stopped. You know, have they turned all the ports off that they're not using? Have they made sure that you know they've got that that accounts when people move on, they're, they're they're shut down fully, that they haven't got redundant admin accounts sat there and stuff like that. It's all for what what would be deemed as quite simple advice, but a lot of the attacks are coming from there. You know, if we make it harder and harder for the cyber criminals because we we lock all the basic stuff down then, you know, slowly, all, all the, the people that can only do those simple criminal activities aren't able to work anymore. They're not able to do that anymore. So it, it, to me, it's get that basics right. Yeah, <clears throat> basics is always a, 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 the building block that you start from, um, for sure. How do you feel about, because obviously, we've, a lot, as you say, a lot of the attacks, I think um, Patricia may have mentioned earlier on, actually, that a lot of these, I guess, breaches and attacks will still come from I guess, email phishing, and you look at the uh, COVID. Um, but what about, do you get any specific targeted attacks that you need to be aware of outside of the, I guess, the standard building blocks that you put in place? So, so we see, yes, I mean, and I suppose it comes down to, you know, everybody wants to be, and organisations like to be open and transparent, which, which I, I fully agree with. But you've got to, there is a level that you want to go to. You know, I've dealt with a number of attacks, you know, the, the, the CEO has gone on holiday, uh, so and it's, it's all over Facebook, it's all over everywhere. So, you know, if, 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 if a criminal is targeting an organisation, they know that the boss is out of the office. So when that email comes into somebody in that organisation saying, 
oh, I'm on holiday and I'm in Spain and I've forgotten, can you do this? Mm. They're more likely to go, oh, right, well, it is my boss. I know it's not come directly from his email, but he's in Spain, he might not have took his, holiday, his computer with him. So, you know, the, the, these whaling attacks, the, 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 these fishing attacks that, that, you know, that are aimed at the big fish, uh, are, are, are happening time and time again. And, you know, you can do the scattergun approach, uh, and we see that all the time. You know, I'll send out a million emails, and only a small amount of people to click on the link, and I'm going to make my money as a criminal. But, you know, I've seen some very, very sophisticated, slow burner attacks against CEOs and senior people in an organization uh, to really target in and get that money. And I've seen a lot of money be lost by organizations as well. Mm. Uh, so, you know, yeah, it, again, it's, it's, it's that, you know, do you need to have your whole organization's structure and everybody's name on the website because as a criminal that's gold mine because yeah. I know exactly who to talk to and I know exactly how to talk in these organizations and then you know members of the, the staff understanding what they're posting uh, does everybody need to know exactly where you're going does everybody need to know you're on holiday in the first place agreed hope, hope the CEO is like Spain though um, <laughs> but, 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 but to, totally agree Marcel from a uh, I guess a VC and what you look for in terms of some of your, the organizations and what you see, what sort of mindset, A, do your organisations that you invest in and also, I guess, from an end user perspective, what sort of mindset do you think is required? Yeah, so the, the, the companies that we invest in is pretty early stage. So there's maybe a handful of people and these, these organisations will grow, you know, until they raise the next round, maybe to, I don't know, 20 people. Um, honestly, security isn't always a big mm -hmm topic of discussion in the board, right? Uh, there's the company yep. that simply tries to survive. But I think, I mean, the way I think about this is, you know, cyber criminals, uh, they act rationally, right? So they will follow the path of least resistance. And, uh, you know, and as an organization, if you're getting chased by a bear, you, know, you don't need to run faster than the bear, you just need to run faster than your mates, you know, on the high trip. So, <laughs> so there's, a, there's an element of, yeah, I know, it's a bit of a cynical way of looking at it, but, you know, it basically boils down to, you know, get the basics right, right? Do, do that 20%, that probably covers 80% of your, uh, you know, of the threats out there. So getting the basics right, that's, that's where you start. Um, that would be my, my thinking around this. <laughs> I agree. I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's getting that basics right because that should deliver to the majority of threats that an organization sees. But once you've mm -hmm. got those building blocks in place, I think you then need to put a bit of cyber intelligence around that in terms of proactively anticipating what's going on and detecting and respond to those digital risks um, that, are, that are out there that you're not currently seeing that mm -hmm. may be happening in the future. So get sure. the basics right and then look at what, is out there that may actually um, damage your particular organization and brand um, in the in the future, making sure you potentially uh, mitigate those as well. Um, yeah. Patricia, oh sorry, we're going to, going to say something? No, I think, I think you're right. You know, once you have that, then you can start to think about, okay, what are the critical assets in my organization? And, and you start to ramp up the security around those, for example. Um, so Patricia, anything to add there? Yes, definitely. I think companies shouldn't have a set and forget mentality because sometimes with cybersecurity investment, it's almost like a knee-jerk reaction. Ideally, companies should work with a few vendors that are also themselves thinking proactively and bringing new products to respond to new attack vendors for their existing customers. So, for example, on our cybersecurity program, that's why we work very closely with 11Path, which is Telefonica cybersecurity arm, just to make sure that they are aware of all the new technologies coming to market. Mm -hmm. Excellent. No, absolutely right. And I know why we're doing an awful lot of work with um, DTSQ and, and, uh, and NCSA, NSCS as well. So it's, um, it's, it's great that you have access to, I guess, a, a whole range of organizations that are really looking to solve um, today's and tomorrow's challenges so it's it's great to be part of the telephonic portfolio so nick what about your good self 
Um, well, actually, just when uh, Patricia mentioned uh, eleven paths, uh, you know, again to go back to something I said much earlier in the, in the show here. Uh, again, a great partner of ours as well, and and you know, a, a customers need to understand that we all work together on these things, and they should feel free to approach us about it. Um, any one of us. Uh, I actually just wanted to add something that uh, to what Phil was saying just a few moments ago when he was talking about the phishing emails, and we're all aware of that. If I could do one thing as a public service announcement here, ladies and gentlemen. Stop answering top 10 <laughs> question lists on Facebook. You are giving out information about your passwords. That's how the criminals find the info. Where did you go on vacation? When did you get married? Where were you born? These are your security <laughs> questions that you answer for your banking password. Stop answering them, please. Um, no, I really think that, uh, it, it, listen, it's a mentality and it's a mindset. Uh, it, it needs to start early. Uh, you know, people like Patricia and Marcel need to impress upon, um, you know, founders of companies that security does have to be part of their thinking. We do have to have awareness campaigns. One of the things that I've seen that actually can be reasonably effective in an organization, large or small, is in the training to employees about the importance of cybersecurity, which can be an incredibly dull topic. Trust me, um, don't use it as a, as an opening line at a cocktail party. I've tried, <laughs> but um, the uh, the in in the training, don't make it all about the company and the importance to the company. You know what? There's personal risk here as well. Right? There's a lot of personal risk to an employee, and if you start teaching people about the personal risk to themselves if they do something wrong or they go off the reservation. Uh, they might pay a little bit more attention to what you're saying, in my opinion. The reality is we have the ability today to separate work and personal data at the device level, in the cloud, all over the place. Um, the solutions are out there. It's just people tend to ignore them. Uh, again, agree. I've only got one question for you. What year were you born? Mm. Oh, so, no, we don't answer those <laughs> questions. No, no, no. Uh, indeed. No, it's, it's interesting. We, we work with an organization who... Uh, put the human-centric element at the, at the forefront of their security portfolio and, and really around email security and they've invested an awful lot of money in their simulation awareness training and this is that, um, I guess, uh, a iterative approach that's targeted in a very, very positive way. As you can say, or oh, as you said, that um, security modules can sometimes be very grey and boring and dull mm. but actually if you make it relevant to them in terms of yeah. uh, the importance of the personal and to the end user and, and making it so that it's actually real, uh, an iterative process that's ongoing rather than that one-off. You know, a lot of organizations, as you know, do, right, you must do this every 12 months. Yeah. Uh, and, and people forget, and people forget. So making sure you have that, not necessarily stealth way of doing things, but a nice, easy, iterative way of improving and making it relevant has to be a, a good, positive thing. And we've seen an awful lot of organizations um, really take up that offer to to really speed up the awareness um, uh, for, for the end users. So uh, totally agree. Right, um, as we're finishing up we're on today's discussion, I've, I guess I've got a, a reasonably open open question for everybody, um, and I think I've got a good answer for this one. But what is the one fundamental piece of advice? that you could have seen that's had the greatest impact for organizations, either seen it, embraced it, been involved, or, or heard about it? And I, I guess I'll go to yourself, Phil, first for, for that particular one. Uh, I suppose it's, a, as, as I've said before, strong passwords. You know, it's it, a lot of times that, you know, these, these other security measures put in place, but a lot of times we default back to a password. And if your password is strong, it's three random words, uh, you know, You'll you'll stop a lot of happening if you you know things from happening. If you look at the the data breaches that we have and then the way that those passwords are reused and that personal information is reused by the criminal gangs, you know if if that password is only ever used once on one site and it's never used again and it doesn't link back, it's not you know you've not got the same password with just a different number at the end of it, uh, you know then then you're going to help protect yourself uh, and as an organisation if that's what you're promoting, you'll protect your your, your your staff members in, in work and also at home because the way that we you know formulate a password at work will probably be the way you're going to formulate your password on your home devices as well um, mm. a, a high likelihood i totally agree with yourself and uh, as i said one of the things i've learned from this is, is the three random words I, I really like that approach um marcel um yourself what's what, what's the uh what about yourself yeah it's kind of two things so first 
you know, get the basics right and uh, and start really early. Um, I think that's kind of a no-brainer. You know, passwords, password managers, multi-factor authentication. You know, um, drive encryption. Um, you know, backups. It's all. It's it's truly table stakes and hygiene. I think. Um, for me, the second thing, what I've seen working really strongly is is try to get some visibility uh, around what's happening. Uh, in terms of your attacks, uh, people trying to get into your network. Because I, I don't think people, like when you don't see it, you don't know it. And when you suddenly s you know, see hundreds of alerts every day, people trying all sorts of ways to get into your, into your organization, I think that level of visibility really uh, scares a lot of people um, and makes them acutely aware of the, of the risk. Uh, that's my second recommendation. I think you've uh, just read my mind, and I thought I had a good one. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> Nick, what about your good self? Um, you know, just to add something slightly different to the mix, I would say um, know the provenance of where things are. Know where your technology is coming from. Who built it? Do you trust them? You know, where was it? Where was it assembled? Who who's touched it? Um, this mythical cloud that you're doing things in now. Where is that? Who has access to your data? Um, you know, people need to be aware of these things. Uh, I've, we've seen it in our industry, in the mobility industry, and this, I'm not going to name names or point any fingers, but devices from other manufacturers, when they're torn down, and all of a sudden it's like, hey, wait a minute, mm -hmm. there's a strange component in there that's not part of the design. Where did it come from? It was assembled at the factory. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so I would just say, uh, supply chain security is... Um, something that is certainly a big topic in certain circles in larger enterprise, such as uh, government and finance. Um, I think it's going to become a bigger topic uh, a little further, you know, um, more broadly as, as we go forward as well. No, da data sovereignty protects all that data is, is absolutely critical. Yeah. Um, mm. Agreed. Um, and last but certainly not least, Patricia. Yes, I think I'm just going to finish with something very simple. If it's too good to be true, it probably isn't true, so be careful what you, you press on. And yeah. I think that can relate to COVID, if you get emails about COVID vaccines, uh, tax refunds, urgent emails from your CEO when maybe your CEO doesn't speak directly to you. Just making sure that you are aware of all the different ways hackers are trying to, to attack you yeah. as, as an employee My in any organization. My, my CEO just sent me an email. He's with a Nigerian prince. It's, uh, things oh, are exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Do not work too... with Nigerian princes. In, indeed. I think, I mean, from, from my point of view, I, I, the, the second point that you made earlier on, I think the um, visibility of what's on the network, so that getting that basic hygiene right, understand mm. what you have in your environment, understand what's attacked or, or attached to your network, because... Um, I guarantee you that you don't know everything that's on your network and what you don't know and what you don't have visibility of, you can't protect. And so for me, that, that's why the basic building blocks is absolutely vital. Um, so I echo some of those early comments. Get it early. If, if I can add something to that, Jim, this is, people might find this interesting. Um, at Samsung, where I work, when we go into work, uh, we, we use an MDM solution, EMM, whatever we want to call it these days, to do certain things to our devices. One of the things that we do is it turns off the cameras, um, secure R&D facility, and you no know, pictures. Um, it ties me to the Wi-Fi network internally, but it prevents me from using my phone uh, or tablet or anything as a hotspot for a third-party device because that's a device that we don't want piggybacking off of my device that is approved and secured onto our network because we don't know where that device came from. We don't control it. This is what I mean about know your supply chain. You are attaching all sorts of strange things to your network and to all of your other devices as peripherals. What are they doing? What are they speaking to? Most people have no idea. That's the scary part to me. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Um, I guess my final, final point just before I, I start to summarize the, the session is um, which kind of phrase is in terms of what do you want to be famous for? And uh, it'd, be, it'd be, I guess, shameless if we didn't actually talk around what we want to be famous for. So, Phil, I will, again, open up with your, your good self. Uh, I guess, what do you want to be famous for? What's, what's, uh, what, what's your ambition, I suppose? So, I suppose uh, what I want to be famous for, an interesting one. Uh, I, I, the Police Cyber Alarm is, is a really, really interesting uh, project. Uh, and, and, and I really think that if we can land Cyber Alarm uh, and, you know, hopefully in the end it will be rolled out nationally, 
you know, we, 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 you know, we've talked about uh, visibility on your networks. Cyber alarm, not internally, but gives you that visibility of who's, who's, who's rattling your door. Uh, it's like having a CCTV on the outside of your building that's connected to the police. And we're able to see who's rattling that front door and who's trying to get into your premises. If they're meant to be in there, we're not interested. But if they're rattling that front door and they shouldn't be doing that, we'll have visibility. And then we can use that information and that intelligence to then find out who these people are and, and, and really get proactive in relation to the, 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 the cyber, uh, cyber criminals. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm going to do my, my shameless plug. Uh, cyberalarm.police.uk is the URL. Uh, please have a look at it. Uh, and, if, and if you're a small to medium-sized enterprise and you're in one of those pilot regions, uh, please get in touch. If you're, if you're not in one of the pilot regions but you're interested, then, then let us know. And, and, and if, you know, hopefully when we are rolling out nationally, we'll be able to get in touch with you and you'll be able to uh, get the system on your, on your network. Uh, whether you have your own internal systems or you're working with another provider, uh, it's a, you know, we, we will sit alongside that just in the background, just, just taking that intelligence uh, that we can then utilise uh, going forward. So, yeah, thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Phil. And, and genuinely wish you every success. We know how important that is as well. Mm -hmm. And, of course, a lot of that information will be presented in the pack um, as part and parcel of the Blue Door. So, Phil, great luck with that. And um, sounds like an absolutely great idea. Nick. No worries. Yeah. Nick. I really enjoy working with our customers around the world, helping them on, you know, we, we, we refer to it as digital transformation, which can encompass a lot of different things, you know, helping companies, uh, divisions of companies um, change the way they do business. Uh, certainly this year with uh, COVID-19, we've seen an acceleration of uh, remote work, which for me is just, you know, another definition for mobility, which is where I work and being able to help help our customers uh, adapt to that um, and do it in, in, a, in a sane way, uh, not overly complex way. doesn't need to be an expensive way of doing it either, but doing it um, you know, uh, with a sound security posture to enhance their productivity and their flexibility in their business. And uh, that's, that's what we like to do on my team over on the Samsung B2B team. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks, Nick. Much appreciated. Um, Marcel, same question to you. Yeah, that's an easy answer. I, I would love to in, make an investment in a company that will help protect, you know, a very l wide range of small and medium businesses, companies that have limited resources to protect themselves and, uh, and build that, uh, you know, uh, very broadly used, very economical solution that delivers high value and high levels of security. No, that's, that's excellent. It's, it's again, it's, it's important that we do our, our utmost here from a security point of view, making it really economic and and really driving that. If it delivers a real value um, and it's cost-effective price, even even better. Especially where mm. resources are limited, skills are limited, and the the threat is increasing day by day. So, uh, I think it's a, a great great thing to uh, to state there from for being famous. So, um, good on you, um, Patricia. Definitely. So I think I'm just going to echo Marcelo a little bit and say that as part of Waira, what I want to achieve and what we want to achieve is making sure that a lot of young startups, young cybersecurity startups manage to scale up, grow and protect millions of users and also companies around the world. I think we will all benefit from that kind of cyber protection. Excellent. No, <clears throat> totally agree. It's a, a pivotal part that we're all playing here, especially if we're sharing insights and sharing best practice to really, to to really, not protect at what cost, but protect at a, a good value cost uh, from all the cybersecurity um, challenges that we are we are facing. So, I guess in in summary, from from my point of view, I, I won't talk about what I want to be famous for because it will involve my golf handicap. But uh, okay. for me, it's it's really about making sure that. We drive a lot of the innovation that's coming from Wira, using a lot of the portfolio that we've got to, to drive uh, a lot of help um, to deliver the right outcomes for our customers. And I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's about making it cost effective and certainly uh, increasing their security to mitigate what we know as sprawling digital and data assets and really help protect that for, from, from uh, cybercrime. So that's, that's where I'm coming from. But for me, in summary today, it's about, you know, Think about the end user, uh, getting the balance right between getting the right security policies in place, working with the right vendors, 
and working with the right partner to bring it all together. As I say, get the basics right, understand the technology platforms, understand the underlying security for those and where they interact with other components within the infrastructure. And then once you've understood those basics, it's then about enhancing that and proactively discovering, automating, remediating. Uh, uh, but the one final word that I've seen come through over and over again, apart from the word end user, is culture. It's getting that culture correct from for each of the different organizations. We all have a different culture. It's about understanding that and then filtering that down to to the IT team, the business team, and the end users. And and I, and I will, uh, I've got a really nice snapshot here from um, Stefan, who's the general CISO from um, Society General. A statement he's made, I think it, 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 it wraps it up quite nicely, where he says, one of the best approaches is to keep positive, be pragmatic, fix the basics, protect first what matters for the business, and be ready to react properly to pertinent threats. Think data, but also think business integrity, awareness, customer experience, compliance, and reputation. In summary, a sound and balanced cyber risk appetite is vital for, for businesses. So that to me wraps up our panel today from cybersecurity protecting at what, what cost. Um, again, Please ask any questions you've got within the uh, the Q&A and all this content will be available for you to uh, to take with you. So good luck.